Uh, so hi everyone, it's my great honor today to introduce Manisha Shaw, uh, who I think sort of needs no introduction as she's an active member of CCPR and a wonderful colleague to us all, but I'm going to do it anyway. So Manisha is a development economist. She's worked in many countries uh, in Africa and in Asia, and I think also in Latin America. She's worked on HIV, AIDS, and sex markets, as well as child health and education. And she's the director of the Global Lab for Research and Action at UCLA. She's also the editor of the Journal of Health Economics. And her work has been funded by the Hewitt Foundation, the NSF, the World Bank, and the Gates Foundation, among others. I'm very excited to hear her talk today. All right, Manisha, take it away. Thanks, Natalie. And thanks, everyone, for coming today. So this is, um, this is actually the very first time I'm presenting this paper ever to an academic audience. And so I'm hoping for lots of questions and you know, I, hopefully I'll have answers to many of them, but I might not always, but very curious to hear your thoughts. Um, this is work that I started six years ago. So it's a, a, a long-term project we've been engaged with and it's joint with uh, Jennifer Seeger who is in the Department of Global Health at GW and then some colleagues at the World Bank, Marcus and Joao, who you know, both helped fund this study uh, but have also been involved as, as co-authors. So with that, let me get started. Let me also say that it's nice to be at a UCLA event today because um, my sister is a Bruin and she's visiting. And so last night forced me to watch basketball, which I normally wouldn't do. And um, so I, I, you know, it's, I had all these like, oh, it would be so nice to be on campus today to be celebrating with everybody. So it's nice to, to see all of you. <laughs> Um, all right, so the, the, the sort of motivation for this study, I guess, is, it, you know, it, it's clearly hard to be an adolescent anywhere in the world these days, um, but it's particularly difficult in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so if we look at like a range of kind of adolescent sexual and reproductive health outcomes, adolescents are, are, are just, you know, facing sort of difficult times. If we look at unintended uh, teen pregnancy, some of the highest rates of unintended teen pregnancy in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. If we look at new HIV AIDS infections, new STI infections, also some of the highest rates in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Same is true for intimate partner violence, just really high rates of, of intimate partner violence that, that adolescents are facing. Facing. And so the, the background of this study is, um, you know, is a partnership with BRAC. So BRAC is one of the largest NGOs in the world, and they do a lot of work in, in sub-Saharan Africa. And the, the issue was sort of like, hey, we're already doing work in sub-Saharan Africa, but we're looking you know, at the work we're doing in Tanzania. We're looking at these sexual and reproductive health outcomes that we've been following. And we, you know, we just don't see big changes, right? We're not seeing big changes in kind of unintended teen pregnancy rates. So we're not seeing big changes in, um, you know, in, in adolescent girls reporting decreases in, in violence. And so, that's really the background for this work. And, and, and you know, and clearly, I, I think, given the, the title of the paper, right, a lot of sexual relationships between adolescents that, that result in these sexual and reproductive health outcomes um, involve power dynamics, right? And, and they involve power dynamics between the males and, and females who are involved in, the, in these relationships. And so if we, you know, we, we look at the literature, there's a, there's a big literature on these issues and I'm going to kind of summarize things in, in four big key points or sort of four takeaways um, from, from a lot of the literature that we've looked at across kind of economics and public health and, and sociology and, and, and the various social sciences. Um, I, I think, first of all, if we're just focusing on adolescence in Sub-Saharan Africa, the majority of the interventions, and I would say the sort of majority of the successful interventions in terms of positively impacting some of these outcomes related to sexual and reproductive health have basically been very like demand side, right? And when I say demand side, I mean, they've either been like education, you know, some have actually been like universal primary education. Others have been more educated, education around HIV AIDS or education around pregnancy, um, education around life skills. Some of you know these types of interventions have had positive impacts on on adolescents, and then there's also been some work in Malawi um, 
with Sarah Baird and, and co-authors uh, giving conditional cash transfers as well as unconditional cash transfers to, to adolescents. Um, the other thing I think that's important to note about a lot of these like successful family planning slash SRH programs, you know, so take Mutlub, for example, in Bangladesh, which really reduced, uh, you know, total fertility rates quite significantly. Um, one of the things that a lot of these programs do is they bundle supply and demand side factors, right? So there's the demand side, the education, et cetera, coupled with like the contraceptives. And so it's often hard, you know, my read of, of this literature and, and given this is CCPR, I'm sure a lot of you have opinions on this, but my, you know, my read of this literature is it seems like demand side has been relatively more important, but that obviously supplying contraceptives has also been important. Um, but it's hard often to like unbundle these impacts. And then the other thing I wanna say about this is that all of these programs have tended to target kind of married adults um, or just, you know, older adults. And so, First of all, they're not targeting adolescents. And second of all, it's not clear the impacts would be the same for, for adolescents. Um, and then I think the, the last thing I wanna say about this is just in, you know, and this is probably true for my work as well, is just a lot of this work, because the beneficiaries of many of these types of programs tend to be girls and women, a lot of this work has just focused on, um, on girls and women, right? And there's just been a lack of involvement of boys and men in a lot of this kind of traditional sexual reproductive health programming. Um, and I guess the, the last point, you know, because much of this paper, as I'll show you in a minute, is actually going to end up focusing on, on violence, um, at least in economics, I think the, the majority of the literature has really focused on, um, on kind of cash decreasing um, intimate partner violence, but, you know, cash as well as employment. And, um, and, and really, again, in kind of more the framework of a household, right? Because a lot of this is around household bargaining, which again, might not be as relevant to adolescents because adolescents are often in these partnerships, but they're not necessarily living together or, or running a household. Okay, so what are we going to do? We, um, you know, the, the, the project is basically a large randomized control trial. And the sort of overarching goal of the randomized control trial was to improve adolescent sexual and reproductive health outcomes. And the three, you know, the three main outcomes that we registered as sort of measures of SRH are going to be unintended pregnancy, um, HIV, STI, we, we, we we test individuals and I'll tell you about that in a minute. And then our last, um, our last outcome of interest will be um, intimate partner violence. And so what we're going to do is we're going to work with BRAC who is already working in Tanzania um, and already working with adolescent females across the country. And we're going to you know, kind of work in their already established program. Actually, let me just show you the next slide which will make this clear. So we're going to work in their ELA clubs which they're running already. And I'll tell you in a few minutes about what these ELA clubs are because I'm sure many of you have not heard of them. But we're going to use the ELA club as kind of our, we're, we're going to have a cluster randomization where we will, we have 150 clubs throughout Tanzania. 50 of these clubs will remain as our control group and they're just going to continue as business as usual. So the, those girls will have ELA clubs and, you know, and then what we're going to do is we're going to layer on, we're going to select another 50 of those clubs where we will uh, partner with Marie Stopes in Tanzania. Marie Stopes is going to bring free contraceptives to these clubs every two months. And so that will be what I call our supply side arm. And we're going to do that in, in this arm two here that you see. And then in arm three, what we're going to do is we're going to layer on an additional treatment, which is in arm three. At baseline, we're going to ask all of our girls who are in this arm, to name their current boyfriends or the you know, current boys that they're having sexual relationships with. And in these 50 communities, um, we are going to invite their boyfriends to a soccer intervention, which I will Anisha, talk about in a minute. Yes. Can I just ask a quick question? So how common is it for these girls to have um, adult men as their boyfriends rather than boys? 
It is very common. So the average, you know, so the girls in our sample, the ELA clubs girl, girls will be 11 to 22. The average age of the girl will be 16. And the average age of the partner that she will name is going to be five years older than her. And, um, and you know, it's a, a great question because the soccer intervention group that we will work with, they normally like to work with boys ages 11 to 19. That is their target group. But because of the sample of girls we had naming older boys, they did agree to work with some of the, you know, they're actually not boys, they're young men. Um, but, but yeah, think about it as kind of a five-year age gap. And one of the things I'll show you later that we move is, is that that age gap decreases a bit because I'm sure as many of you know that, you know, the sort of larger the age gap, the, the riskier the relationship. Um, okay, so those are, that's kind of our cluster randomization. The other piece of this that we will layer on, so after we run our baseline survey, we will also layer on an individual randomization from each of these arms where we'll randomly select girls to do a goal setting exercise, which I will tell you about in, in a few minutes. But this is just the design. So a couple of things I wanna flag about the design. There's no like control group of like, girls getting nothing. Our control group, all of our results will be relative to this ELA club, um, you know, control group, okay? Um, and so just to sort of give you a preview of what we're going to find and where we're going with all of this, um, you know, our, our main research questions, of course, were you know, one, I, I've been very interested in this issue of like, hey, once we start getting boys and young men involved in these types of interventions, does that actually do girls and young women fare better? And in fact, what we are going to find is in these communities where we're getting the boyfriends involved in these 50 communities. And I, I should mention, I'm going to use club and community interchangeably because we're working in rural Tanzania. So think about these as really small rural communities that have a club in them. Um, but you know, these are sort of small rural areas. And so yes, in those communities, our girls will report decreases in intimate partner violence two years later. Um, we're also going to find some interesting impacts from this goal setting exercise, which I'll tell you more about. And, and, and similarly in those communi communities, sorry, in, in, in those, when we look at the impact of, of goal setting, we'll find decreases as well in, in intimate partner violence. Our supply side intervention, the like bringing contraceptives to clubs is an absolute flop. <laughs> We're kidding. There's going to be no impact of supplying free contraceptives. And, um, and we can talk a little about what happened there and why that is the case. Um, but basically, even though we bring these contraceptives to these clubs, their take up is ridiculously low. Like these girls just do not take up any of these modern contraceptives. And, um, and sort of good news for all the, the adolescents in our study, um, when we tested everyone at baseline, we, you know, we did STI as well as HIV testing, prevalence was just far too low and we were very underpowered. So, so this, you know, the study in the end, the sort of outcomes where we're going to see the most movement will be um, IPV. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little about the, the contraceptive issue as well. So let me now tell you a little about what we did. And, and I guess just to give you an idea of where we're going now, um, I'm going to tell you about the interventions. I then want to show you, you know, these, these impacts of the main, uh, you know, the, the, the main impacts that we had registered. And then what I'm going to do is, I, you know, I want to unpack these results and tell you a little about what we think is going on in terms of mechanisms. And so we're going to build um, I, I hesitate to call it a model, but we're going to build a little model or a conceptual framework to then help us think through some of, some of the mechanisms of why we're actually observing these decreases in, in violence. So this is a map of, of Tanzania, and we were working in Dodoma, in this uh, state of Dodoma, uh, Iringa, and Mbeya. So these are the three regions that our 150 clubs will be in. And as I mentioned, um, these are all relatively rural communities. Um, and, you know, BRAC does run clubs in Dar es Salaam, which is a big urban center, but we, we don't include any of those clubs in our sample because these three areas were much more similar and, and kind of, um, you know, 
adding the urban clubs added more complications. So, so think about um, these, these clubs as kind of the average club is 20 to 21 members. The girls are around ages 11 to 22. Um, this is just a picture from Brack of you know, one of the, the clubs. There's a lot of games and dancing and there's just a lot of fun. I've spent a lot of time in, in these clubs. And the, the sort of idea behind these clubs, the reason Brack started these, they're these life skills, safe spaces where girls can go after school um, to learn you know, all sorts of things around adolescence, reproductive health, Health, menstruation, like what safe relationships with boys look like, you know, building confidence. Uh, and, and ELA itself stands for empowerment and livelihood for adolescents. So it's very much this idea of like, how do we kind of empower our girls to make safer choices and, and you know, and live healthier lives. And as I mentioned, the age group is around 11, you know, it's more like 11 to 22, but it maxes out at 24. Um, for the older, younger women who come to these things, there's also additional like livelihood training around like access to microfinance and like and, um, and income generating opportunities. There's been a few studies on um, looking at the impacts of ELA. And I guess broadly speaking, the, the sort of impacts have been much more positive in, um, in, in Uganda. There's actually, I don't know if I cite this here, there's some new work in Sierra Leone uh, where ELA has been fairly effective. Part of the reason Brack had gotten in touch with me is because there was an impact evaluation done of ELA in Tanzania and it found like no positive impacts from the programming at all. And so that was actually the start of the collaboration is like, how can we improve ELA and, and, and make it better, um, but in a way where we're you know, doing interventions that are sort of low cost and, and scalable and easy for them to implement. And so they weren't at all interested in like, you know, cash transfers or condition, you know, they, they sort of wanted things that they would be able to, to carry on post, um, you know, post this study. And so we had, I actually had a PhD student, and some of you might even remember him because he was a CCPR. So Chad Stetcher went and spent some time in Tanzania um, in these clubs with the idea of like, hey, what would be some interesting interventions that, um, you know, that we could kind of test out and, and implement in these clubs. And one of the things that came up a lot was the, you know, the young women basically saying, hey, we would use contraceptives, but we live in these communities where like, you know, everybody, you go to the pharmacy, everyone in the pharmacy knows my parents. And so there's no way I'm going to go to the local pharmacy and buy condoms. Um, and, you know, and so hence this idea of like, hey, why don't we try bringing contraceptives to, you know, to these clubs? Right. And, and so the, the way this would work is that um, we, you know, a nurse would visit these clubs every two months and they had set up a little private area in the club where they could interact, um, you know, if, if any of the females wanted to, to access any of the supplies. And they basically, you know, they, of course, brought like condoms and female condoms. They also brought the pill. Um, but Marie Stopes really pushes LARCs, right? So these long acting reversible contraceptives, that's mostly like their big business model. And so, um, you know, they would also bring like implants and they would do the implants, you know, on, on site. They also had injectables. And then for the IUDs, if any of the girls wanted IUDs, they would refer them to the, you know, the local free clinic. <clears throat> So that's our, that's kind of the supply side. So that's going to happen, you know, as I mentioned, we have these 50 clubs that are ELA only, and then we're going to have uh, these nurses visiting these other uh, ELA clubs with, with uh, the supply side. So, you know, it's not a terribly complicated intervention. Um, the, the grassroots soccer intervention, right, so this is, this is going to now happen in these 50 communities. We're going to layer this on top. Of, of the supply side in, in 50 of these communities where we'll also then start working with um, the sort of young men in these communities. And so in a way you should think about grassroots soccer is an empowerment program for, for young men. And so the, the way this program works is they have, it's a 10 week curriculum. The boys get together um, once a week. Let me just show you, I you know, do I? Yeah, I do. So the boys get together once a week on a soccer pitch. 
and um, and during you know each of their sessions, there's each session has sort of like a you know a key message and, and a topic. And so just to give you an example of like what this is one of the sessions where on the soccer pitch, the coaches set up cones. And each cone for them is like a risk behavior, right? So this is this cone is unprotected sex. This cone is multiple partners. You know, this cone is older partners. This cone is sex and alcohol. And so the this exercise is, hey, you have to kick the soccer ball around each cone, and you don't want to touch any of the cones because those cones are things that you should be avoiding, right? Because they're they're risk behaviors, and and so all of the you know the entire curriculum is around the guys playing soccer but as they're playing soccer they're learning you know they're sort of learning about uh risk behavior risky partners using contraceptives um, there's a lot of hiv aids prevention but there's a lot like throughout the entire curriculum there's a lot of this sort of we should be respecting girls and women in our community, you know, and they have things like red card exercises, which is like, if you see a bus driver, you know, harassing girls for sex, because she doesn't have money to pay for like bus fare, you know, it's in you should be helping her, right. So there's a lot of this, like, I would say this idea that kind of gender relations aren't a zero sum game, right? That boys and young men also gain from helping the girls and young women in their communities, that they're all sort of better off when they, when they respect each other and work together. And, um, and so I, I guess like all of that to say, you know, and I've just written some of the, the key messages here, um, you know, in life, we should all stand up for girls and women to protect them from abuse uh, or, when communicating with someone of the opposite sex, remember to find a safe place to talk, show respect to the person you're communicating with, make strong eye contact and, and stay positive. Um, so anyways, I, I guess all of this to say, I, I, I became a big fan of their curriculum over time. And I have, I have two boys and I joke with them that they need to bring this curriculum to, to the US because it's just, it's a great curriculum. <laughs> Um, so that's grassroots soccer. I'm trying to think if I need to say anything else about this. Oh, I guess the one thing I should say is that um, in the 50 communities where grassroots soccer was working, we had paid for a thousand boys to be kind of enrolled in their program. In the end, uh, grassroots soccer sort of found and enrolled about like 500 of our boyfriends and then the other 500 boys were just like boys they found in these same communities and so some of the impacts from grassroots soccer you'll see will be like you know just the direct impacts of boyfriends of these girls and then some of them will be just spillovers from the community of other boys being treated that weren't necessarily boyfriends at baseline i mean they could be boyfriends at endline we, we just don't know um and we can talk about that later as well. Okay. So goal, the, the last, so this was a goal setting we did at the individual level. We ran our baseline survey. We sort of randomly selected girls from each arm and, and, um, and we wanted to do goal setting. And, and part of why we thought goal setting would be interesting is, you know, there's been a lot of interesting new research recently on goal setting being effective, like for adolescents, you know, low income youth in Chicago, for example, in the school setting, the goal setting has been very successful. There's been a lot of goal setting being used in cognitive behavioral therapy recently. Uh, we hadn't seen it being applied to sexual and reproductive health. And so we thought, hey, let's try this, right? Because goal setting itself is about like, self-regulation strategies. It's, you know, about problems with self-control, present bias. So all of these things are sort of perfect for adolescents and perfect for sexual and reproductive health. And so what we did was honestly, we just took sort of standard goal setting that, you know, there's nothing kind of interesting about what we did here in terms of we just took the standard curriculum I think the interesting piece of what we did was applying it to section reproductive health, right? And so what we did with each of our girls who was sort of selected to participate in goal setting was we provided the girls with the overall goal, which was to stay healthy, adopt, you know, safe sexual behaviors in order to kind of have this end goal of remaining HIV and STI free. 
And so the, the, the way this, you know, for those of you who are less familiar with this process, uh, it, it, it's the idea is it's these Duran 1981 SMART, where SMART stands for specific, S should be specific, right? So you need to be clear when the step has been achieved, measurable, we should be able to track progress. Um, achievable is something you can actually do, relevant, right? It should be, your strategy should be linked to the ultimate goal of staying healthy and then timely, right? So there should be, the, the goal should be achievable in, in, the, in you know, the time period. And so we did this individually. It was kind of a 60 to 90 minute in exercise with each girl. Um, each girl had to write down zero to three strategies that she would have to engage in over the next year, basically, to, to achieve this goal. She had to think through things that might be difficult or, you know, behavioral things that might come up. And, you know, so there was a lot of writing involved. We checked in, the enumerators went back to the clubs four months later, they checked in, you know, they had all of this information on like a tablet and sort of like, hey, you said you were gonna, you know, do this, how is it going, what's going on? And then we, you know, at the end line, we followed up with them one more time. And I'm going to show you, so I have to tell you that I was very, um, <laughs> I, I'm going to show you now some data from the goal setting exercise before we even get to the, the data of the study, because I have to tell you, when we conceived of goal setting, I had wanted to do it coupled with some money for the girls. And, and I guess, you know, that comes from my feeling of like, oh, goal setting with no money, was this even going to work? In the end, BRAC didn't want us giving any of the participants any financing. And so, um, so there's, you know, we just did like this pure goal setting exercise with them. The main strategies, you know, this is just to show you some of the strategies that the girls uh, relayed to us. I think the number one strategy, use a condom. And then the number two and three were be faithful. And, and number three was abstinence. Um, this is just to show you this. These are just some associations between predictors of like the number of the strategies each girl set, right? Because they could set anywhere between zero and three. And then this is at end line, we ask them like, how many of your strategies did you actually achieve? And what I think is really interesting, you know, we, we did some of these, the PHQ2 uh, depression uh, screens on girls at baseline and end line. And, and we also did some self-efficacy screening with them. And what's really interesting to me about these associations is that, um, you know, that females who suffer from depression, females who have lower self-efficacy measures are also, are also setting fewer strategies and also reporting that they're um, achieving fewer strategies. Um, and then it also looks like there's some correlation here with how wealthy you are, right? I mean, all of these girls, I should say, are low income and poor, but there is some, some heterogeneity and, and it's interesting as, as well that, that wealth seems to matter. Um, the other thing we looked at just, you know, to conditional on sort of engaging in goal setting, these are associations between, so this is, you know, you saying that one of your strategies will be to abstain from sex. And I think what's interesting is that for the most part, you know, whatever strategy you set. So if you say you were going to abstain from sex, for example, you, um, you know, you're much more likely to not have sex. Your, you know, ever had sex decreases. If what your main goal was to use a condom, for example, if we look here at column six, you are much more likely to use a condom. So again, you know, this is all sort of suggestive, but it seems suggestive that the girls who set strategies um, actually engaged in some of these, you know, the strategies that, that they said they were going to. Okay, so timeline, what do we do? We, we go in, we actually, there's a census beforehand. This is about a two year study. You know, we run our census and on, um, you know, to get a list of all of the girls in, um, in, in the ELA clubs. We run our baseline survey and then all of our interventions start. And then two years later, we go back and we collect data again on, on all the same girls. Um, Manisha, can I ask you a quick question? Please. Hi. Um, so I have two questions. So ELA club, so, so these girls are voluntarily participating. So yes. are they, is it, are the characteristics of these girls similar to non-participants in the same, same community is one question. 
And then another question is over these two periods, two years of period, are they, I mean, how is the attrition? Are, do they stay or do interventions um, affect participation rate of any sort? Yeah, so I'll tell you about attrition. Um, we lose about 17% of our girls by end line. So it's not terrible. Um, and I think more importantly, though, it's not differential by sort of treatment status. And so we're less worried about attrition. Um, I think, you know, in terms of like thinking about who these girls are in the community, I, I should have mentioned a couple of things. Like one is you don't actually, even though these are like after school clubs, you don't actually have to be enrolled in school. So they have currently enrolled girls who have dropped out, girls who have never enrolled, like they have the whole spectrum from the community. Um, you know, you do have to sort of commit to coming five to six days a week. So it's a big commitment from families to like allow their, you know, teenage daughters to be spending time in these clubs every afternoon and, and like not doing domestic chores at home, right? Or helping around the house. Um, I would say like more because these are small-ish communities and they're relatively poor, the girls do look kind of relatively similar to the rest of the girls in the community. Maybe they're like slightly worse off because there is, you know, there is, they can only accommodate, you know, 20 to 25 girls. And so they can't take everyone in the community, though there is a lot, you know, in and out in terms of new girl start, they, you sort of age out and then it opens up spots. Um, so I would say think of these as kind of fairly, these girls are fairly representative of the communities. They're not gonna be like the, the best, right? In that they're sort of selected on, hey, we're a little worried about you, you know, so come hang out in this club. Um, So this is just to give you an idea, this is baseline data now. And I, I'm going to, these are our, all of our main outcomes of interest, okay? And I, this is the entire sample. And so you'll, you know, you'll see, these are, you know, th these are kind of all of our intimate partner violence outcomes, ever pregnant. You'll see here, as I mentioned, S both testing for STI as well as um, HIVs was very, very low. Um, this second column is, I, I, this is baseline data as well, but what I've done here now is I've cut the baseline data by whether you were already sexually active at, um, at baseline, because remember, we're starting here as low as age is 11, but most, for most of these females, like sex sort of turns on around ages 16, 16 to 17, it's weird, like sort of very few are sexually active, and then at 16, like you know, it just really changes. And after 16, well, there's just a lot of sexual activity. And, and so I think like one of the things we wanted to look at was, you know, I gave you this number of like one in three uh, experience IPV, right? And so how does our data look relative to this number? And in fact, if you look at the sort of sexually active cohort at baseline, our numbers look very similar to this one in three experiencing any IPV in, in the last year. Um, what else do I want to say about this? So we're going to, you know, in the survey, we asked very detailed information about like psychological, physical, as well as um, sexual abuse, both often as well in the, as in the last year. And when I show you um, regression results, we're going to create indices of the kind of last year as well as, as often just to make things easier. Um, and I guess I think that's it, unless there are any questions about that. And, and you know, this is an RCT, and so you should be worried about baseline balance. And I'm not going to show you a lot of tables, but I can tell you we, we're very well balanced, and we have, we've done a lot of that work in the paper. Um, and, you know, and this is just to, this is one table to show you balance, again, of our, of our um, main outcomes of interest and, and, you know, some of our demographic characteristics. Any questions before I go to the empirical strategy? Okay, great. So, sorry, Felicia, can I ask you one question? Of course. Uh, did you think at all about how these clubs change the social networks of the girls? Because now you're hanging out specifically with the people who are in the club. Okay. I mean, I think you definitely are hanging out a lot with the girls in the clubs. Um, 
And so, so yeah, you're definitely hanging out a lot with the girls in the clubs. You're also like hanging out a lot with like the boys who hang out with the girls of the girls in the clubs. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure there is an element of sort of sexual networks changing, but I guess, what are you worried about? I don't know if I'm super worried, but one thing I remember there was this paper by uh, Rebecca Fulton and co-authors where they basically worked at when they let uh, them have like, I think it was like there was some elections and they got to hang out after school and do projects if they got elected. And then it was like the girls who like didn't get in were super unhappy because now they didn't have anyone to hang out with. So things, so sort of thinking about like little spillovers on people who, you know, didn't get to uh, yeah. be in the program. So. I want you to like remember this or think about this later for when we talk through mechanisms, because today I'm not going to show you anything about like general equilibrium effects of, you know, because one of the things I'm going to show you is that there's definitely going to be changes in partnerships and changes in quality of partnerships. And one of the things we're going to worry about, which we haven't been able to do much with yet is like what's going on with partnership sorting, right? And is it the fact that maybe like some of the girls in our club who are not in our clubs are ending up with these like lower quality guys now? Um, and, and we're thinking about this, but let me, let me say, let's come back to that. Um, okay, so what were, yes. Mm -hmm. I'd love to ask a, uh, two quick questions. One is, did you have any measures for the girls who are in school of academic performance? Uh, because one does read in the literature, or at least an argument for these safe spaces is to keep girls in school that they are ways that, you know, to prevent dropouts. Um, so that's my first question. And then second, I was just wondering, um, that seemed like a very high pregnancy rate um, among mm -hmm. the ever sexually active girls. And I was, especially if you think that uh, I don't know, it just seemed very high. So I was just wondering, so did some of the girls then have children already uh, who were enrolled in it uh, and or was abortion going on? You know, what was going on? Yeah, so you're absolutely right that that's a really high pregnancy rate. And in fact, that was part of why Tanzania Brack was like basically calling me because they were like, we've been doing this work yet pregnancy rates are really high. Um, and so, yes, a lot of the older, you know, that sort of 18 plus young women who come to the club often will bring their small infants with them. And so there are often like little babies running around the clubs. Um, and you're exactly right about the high rates. Um, and then the, the, the dropout never enroll question, right? So we, you know, we haven't looked at, okay, so a couple of things. One is in Tanzania, there hasn't been much evidence of these clubs like keeping girls enrolled in school. Um, there's some question about is that just also because of what's been going on with the president who actually recently just died, but there were some kind of, you know, bad things happening with him in school policy. Um, but, you know, but you're exactly right that part of the sort of after school idea was to like, hey, let's keep girls, you know, let's encourage them to stay in school and not drop out it hasn't been happening as much as they would have liked. One thing I could do that we haven't looked at is we actually did give um, all of the girls sort of a like small cognitive test at baseline and end line, um, which we haven't you know, looked at it, at least to look at some measures of, of learning and, and we could definitely do that. I, I haven't yet though. Um, okay, so in terms of our empirical strategy, we're gonna use our baseline and end line data and we're going to, we're just going to run simple like difference and difference models. We're going to include all of the, remember, so there's going to be the like cluster level randomization stuff that happened at the club level, right? Which will be the supply side and the boys side, the boys arm. There will be the goal setting, which was at the individual level. So everything will be clustered at the club level. We're going to include club fixed effects. And what I'm basically, the, the sort of coefficients of interest that I will show you are going to be this like beta one, beta two and beta three, which are just going to be our you know intention to treat estimates, right? So whatever arm you were assigned to, we're just going to, I'm going to show you the ITT estimates of um, you know the effect of say like, you know, boys getting treated in your village or the effect of you being offered the goal setting or the effect of, you know, the supply side, the contraceptive thing happening in, in your community. All of this will be relative to a base of, of just getting ELA only. Um, 
and then in some models, you know, we'll, we will always include age and education because those are really sort of important determinants of, of all of these SRH outcomes. We won't include many other controls. We can, it, it just doesn't, you know, it's an RCT and it doesn't really matter that, that much. And what I'm going to show you instead of tables right now is I'm just going to show you figures. So, um, so this, this figure is going to, get, this figure is going to be a graph of the coefficient beta one. So this is going to be, you know, the ITT effect of, you know, of, of grassroots soccer happening in, you know, in your communities. And this is an index of IPV often. So it's going to be the, you know, the often, uh, which comprises the, the psychological, physical, and for sex. And then we'll have another index of, of IPV happening in the last year. And so, you know, you can think of this as kind of more frequent and this happening that, you know, in the last year. And, and, and so for the, what this, what this figure is showing you is that for the entire sample, um, there's a 0.16 standard deviation in decrease in IPV often and a 0.12 standard deviation decrease in IPV in the last year. And this is re as reported by girls who are in these um, communities where, where boys got grassroots soccer. Okay, so that's the big kind of boys result for the whole sample. Um, the, the, this is, now this is the ITT impact for goal setting. So I think this is the beta three from that equation. And so this is basically saying that, you know, IPV, the IPV often index decreases by 0.13 standard deviations and the IPV last year index decreases by 0.113 standard deviations again for, um, for the goal setting arm, okay? And then for the supply side, there's, absolutely nothing happening on violence. But, you know, one could argue that maybe we wouldn't expect much happening on, you know, for the supply side on, on violence. And, and honestly, we were most, you know, interested in, in sort of pregnancy for the supply side. There's just, there's nothing going on with the supply side arm. And so I'm, you know, after the next slide, I'm, I'm not going to focus much on, on supply side. And, but what, what I am going to show you here is this table, which each column, so this is our control ELA only. These are our supply, you know, this is our supply arm. These were the clubs that, you know, we're getting uh, Marie Stopes. And then this is our, our boys arm. And basically what I wanna show you here is that at baseline, like almost nobody is using, say, you know, so at baseline, like 2% of our control girls are using injectables. And guess what? At end line, like 2.8% are. And in fact, in our supply arm at baseline, 2.6% are using it at end line, 2%. Implant, same thing, you know, use 1% at baseline, 2%. At so all of this to say is that even though we were kind of bringing these contraceptives free, uh, highly available, there, there's just like no movement. The only place we see some increase, but this is happening in our, in our control group as well, is, is that condom use does seem to be increasing over time in all of these arms. Um, so again, it, it, I don't think it's happening because of Marie Stopes, but, but it is happening. Um, but the sort of modern contraceptive take up is, is very low um, and, and, and almost not happening. Um, Manisha, I'm guessing it would work the same, but have you looked at this when you were strict just to the sexually active at baseline goals? Because I'm guessing there's no way you're going to get the 11 year olds to take up yeah, quite it, reasonably. So exactly. There's nothing. I mean, there's nothing on pregnancy. There's nothing on take up. And, and so I guess like this is this was a lesson to us, which was this idea that I was kind of interested in testing, which is just bringing like free bags of contraceptives and kind of dumping them in these clubs does not you know, it has no, it doesn't sort of have the impact you're looking, you, you do need, you know, maybe there is a reason these interventions are always heavily bundled with demand side, right? Which is you need to also engage in the like explaining to these girls and convincing these girls that these are important things for them to adopt if you actually want to see kind of more take up. Um, and so that, that was like a big lesson from this that it's just, you know, bringing them is not enough. You need to do a lot more than just bring them. 
Um, okay, so the other, I guess, and this equation looks like a, is, is a mess, but really all I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this equation here, the DD, and I want to um, interact it with whether or not you were sexually active at baseline. Because you could, you know, you could, we could have a debate right now. None of you got, none of you have said this, but you could say, hey, like a 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.12 standard deviation decrease in, in violence isn't that big, right? Um, and so then what we say is, hey, let's look at this exactly as Natalie asked, let's just look at some of these outcomes for girls who were already sexually active at, um, at baseline. And so we do that for all of our outcomes. And what I think is interesting is, you know, as I just mentioned, we get nothing on kind of the pregnancy, but we see much bigger impacts for our decreases in violence, right? And so here, just to, this is like the, what I'm showing you here is the overall effect for, um, for girls who are in the boy's arm, right? So for girls in these communities where the boyfriends are also getting treated, if they were sexually active at baseline, we're observing a 0.5 standard deviation decrease in, in intimate partner violence often. And similarly, same thing for the goal setting arm. And, and I guess the other thing I should flag though is so basically all of the effects are really coming off of the girls who were sexually active. There's nothing going on for the girls who weren't sexually active at baseline, which sort of makes sense because you, you need to kind of be sexually active for, you know, for the, the violence to be taking place for the most part. And you'll see the same thing is happening for the goal setting arm here, right? So um, if you were sexually active at baseline, at end line, you're reporting about a 0.3 uh, standard deviation decrease in, in experiencing IPV often, okay? And so, and, and I guess like the other heterogeneity that we look at that's interesting, I, I won't show you right now is age. And it's obviously it's age because age and sexual activity are highly correlated, right? So, if, you know, if you were, if I was to sort of do this by like age 17 and over at baseline, you would see very similar results. Are there any questions now before I, my, I sort of move on? So then what we do is we think, okay, we, we're seeing these interesting decreases in IPV, right, from, um, for the, our females who were assigned to the, the, you know, the boys soccer arm, as well as our females who were assigned to, to goal setting. Um, we're observing that the effects are larger for females who were having sex at baseline. And so we, you know, the, the, the second part of the paper or the project is really trying to understand like what are the mechanisms driving, um, driving these, these main results. And it, if you look at the literature on violence, um, the literature has really uh, emphasized two motivations for violence. Okay, so the first is this idea that violence is instrumental, meaning like violence is used as a tool by men for controlling behavior and resources for their of their female partners. Um, and, and in our model, the in, sorry, in our world, the way we're going to model this kind of instrumental violence will be that violence will be used instrumentally uh, to get or to be able to engage in risky sex when the female doesn't want to engage in risky sex. So there will be some disagreement over like wanting to have risky sex and violence will be used instrumentally by the male in order to get risky sex out of the female. Okay. The, the sort of other motivation for violence that you see in the literature is what they call, you know, what the researchers call expressive uh, violence. And this is the idea that, um, you know, violence against female partners provides men with some sort of source of gratification, whether it's through direct utility, um, you know, or, or some irrational impulse, okay? But, but I guess the, the kind of way to differentiate these things are like instrumental is like, hey, I wanna get something from you. So I'm gonna use violence to get that from you versus expressive is much more like, hey, you know, it gives me some sort of positive utility to like hate you, okay? And, and but, but I think what like both of these motivations suggest is that there's a potentially important role of learning and socialization, right? In that, if, if we can sort of change men's um, 
you know, reasons for like wanting to perpetrate violence, well, then there is some promise for like educational interventions like grassroots soccer, for example, which might teach boys and, and young men, right? That, um, that other type of behaviors might be better for them as, as well. Manisha, so, can I ask you yeah. a question about this? Yes. Do you know anything about the um, level of violence in the girls' households that is perpetrated by other people and their views of the, about that? So that that's a great question um, because the you know I think you're exactly right that a lot of this violence is highly correlated. That if you sort of experience violence as a young kid in your household, you're much more likely then to experience it later because maybe you're like pairing with boys who have a much higher propensity to be abusive towards you. Um, unfortunately, we did not ask our adolescents like what's going on in their home violence wise. Um, but but there is there is literature suggesting that these things are highly correlated kind of across time and over space. Okay, so here's our conceptual framework. Um, and, and this is very new. So obviously, like, feel free to ask me questions and, you know, happy to, to talk about this. But we're, we're basically going to build a conceptual framework around sexual behavior, where you'll have like the male partner and the female partner. Okay, so we're going to have utility for each of these partners where M is for male, F is for female. Um, your utility from this kind of sexual activity is going to depend on three things, right? There will be, and, and sort of the way we've modeled these things right now are zero one. And so this violence is violence either happens or it doesn't, okay? It's a zero one. Um, S here is going to be unprotected sex, okay? And so, um, you know, think here of like S is, again, S is going to be a zero one. The zero could be no sex, it could be using a condom, right? But the, the idea here is that when S equals one, you're having risky sex, okay? Violence, it either happens or it doesn't, it's zero, one. And then what else do I wanna say? Right, H, H is like health, okay? And so think about H as your health level. H is obviously going to be a function of whether or not you're having risky sex, S. And, and you know whether or not you're having risky sex may also be a function of violence if violence is being used instrumentally. So if I'm the girl and violence is being used instrumentally against me in order for the guy to engage in risky sex with me, okay? And so the idea here now is that boys and girls both, so the delta U, delta S being positive means we all like risky sex. Okay, we all sort of prefer, the idea here is we have preferences for like non-condom sex or, or riskier sex, um, but this unprotected sex entails risk, you know, a health risk, right? So you could get HIV, you could get an STI. And so that's why this Delta H, Delta S term is negative in that if you're having unprotected sex, there's a health cost to that, there's health risk to that. And then, um, and obviously though, better health right, higher utility. So delta U, delta H is, is going to be positive. And so what we can do is we can, um, we can differentiate, you know, differentiate the utility function and come, we, we get come up with this pi I, which is this idea where the partner, um, you're going to be willing to engage in unprotected risky sex if this term, so delta U, delta S, this is positive, right? plus this delta U, delta H, which we've also said is positive, but this delta H, delta S, this is going to be our negative, right? This is going to be our potential health cost from engaging in risky sex. So this term is equal to pi. When pi is greater than zero, you see a willingness to engage in unprotected sex. When pi is less than zero, you're unwilling to engage in unprotected sex, okay? And so there's a couple of things I wanna say here. So when both pi, when pi m and pi f say are both greater than zero, there's no violence because both partners wanna engage in unprotected sex and they're just gonna engage in unprotected sex, right? And I would say the same as when both of these, when both partners don't want sort of you know, risky sex and when both of these things are, net, are less than zero, there won't be any violence. And you know, they'll both decide that they wanna engage in kind of protected sex, 
okay? With violence, so when V equals one, the boy can force the girl to engage in unprotected sex against her will. So this is the world where our pi m, right? So this is the boy's willingness to engage in unprotected sex is positive. The female's willingness to engage in unprotected sex is negative. And in case of a disagreement between these two in this world, what we can do, what I'm basically going to do, sorry, is I'm going to, uh, this equation two, I'm gonna to totally differentiate this with respect to V violence. I'm gonna come up with this term here, right? So this term is going to be the total impact of violence on each partner's utility. And so this term here, this du dv, think about this term as just your direct disutility from violence, okay? And so for boys, this kind of direct disutility for violence could be like maybe psychic costs that you and you know when you're like hitting a girl there's like psychic costs to you it could be stigma costs to you right that maybe like the stigma gets out that you're doing these things right for girls this direct disutility from violence i think is obviously more violence because obvious is more obvious because you know you're having violence inflicted on you um so there's all sorts of psychic costs there's also potential physical costs etc cetera, etc cetera, okay so this piece of it is your um your di direct disutility from violence this second term the second term now is going to capture that indirect or what i call that instrumental and it, it could be disutility. It's going to be disutility clearly if you're the girl, right? Um, but it, it's going to be that instrumental piece of, of the violence, okay? And, um, and remember this pi now is going to be that, that willingness to engage in, in unprotected or risky sex piece of it. And so the idea here is that, um, you know, in, in equilibrium, right, in, in kind of equilibrium, the boy is going to choose whether or not to engage in violence to maximize his utility. But remember now that the boy and the girl will each have a participation constraint, right, in that like, for the for the female, right, we've said that her utility is going to be a function of like her health, uh, you know, unprotected sex and violence this U bar of F is going to denote her outside option, right? And so the idea here is, is at some point she can also just like walk away and be like, hey, I no longer, you know, I, I, this relationship is no longer working for me and my outside option looks much better, whether that's like another partnership, another boyfriend, or just like being single, abstaining, whatever it is, I'm gonna walk away, okay? Um, and then the same will be true for the boy where each, you know, each male will also have some level of utility that's at least as great as his own outside option, right? And so this is his, you know, utility from being in the relationship. And then this is this U bar of M is, um, is, is, you know, where he'll basically walk away, okay? And so now if I, you know, let, let me, before I now get to kind of the interventions and, and where I think these, you know, what these interventions are impacting, I, I don't know if anyone has questions or if I, I know it's always hard to sort of talk through models and, and even harder on Zoom. But um, so, I, Manish, I do, oh, sorry, Paula. Um, so, I, I guess you have a lot of questions, Manisha. Um, so I think about this as implicitly having an incomplete contracting problem in this model, because it should, if men are engaging in violence here, there's utility being left on the table, right? That if they could like contract not to engage in the violence, uh, they would increase total utility, unless men are getting some gratification from engaging in violence. Yeah, you know what, Natalie, you're reminding, so, so yes, and I, let me say, give you one assumption that I, forgot to mention, which, so right now, we are basically assuming um, that violence entails a utility loss for both males and females, okay? That in reality, that might not always be true for all men. Um, and one of the things we're thinking about is how do we extend this model to get rid of this assumption, right? That, um, 
that it sort of is entailing this. I, I think this is true. This, this assumption is not at all controversial for women, I think. It, one could argue it might be slightly controversial for, um, for some men. Um, but what I'm going to show you is that most of the violence that we see occurring seems to be much more this instrumental channel, in fact, and not really this idea that like, there's just like certain guys out there who, who get like, you know, who have some gratification from, from engaging in violent behavior. Just a, a quick other thing is that um, there is a lot of young people who engage in unprotected sex and violence isn't part of the equation and, and they don't necessarily, particularly the girls don't necessarily want to engage in unprotected sex, but they might want to please their partner or not lose their partner or they're getting some other kinds of, you know, goods or services from their partner. But, but the point is, is that uh, violence is, doesn't have to be part of the picture and they can still not want to have unprotected sex. Is that somehow? Yeah. Into account? Mm -hmm. Yes, agreed. And so we, so you're exactly right. You can be in this world where like V equals zero um, and you still have, you know, either like some disagreement that is not kind of resolved instrumentally um, and we need to like specify that better in the model, but that that is allowed in our model. Yes, I I am sort of focusing on the violence piece of this. I guess both because I I want to sort of think through what's going on in our results. But you're absolutely right, Pam. Yeah. Any other questions, Manisha? But it's kind of related to that. Just quickly, um, right. is there anything else in your survey then where? Because kind of another strategy that the males can engage in is more of a sugar daddy strategy of of, of um, co-opting the girls into doing things they don't want to do through other means, which may not be violence, but maybe offering them money. You know, I mean, you yeah. mentioned that the the age difference is yeah. like five years, which could be a lot, and so there are other ways of intimidating, coercing, forcing, deceiving. You see the tip of the iceberg of sorts, but maybe there's some other data on similar yep. strategies. I okay, agreed with both of you. Um, yeah, need, need to think through that more because I, absolutely, I, I think you're both absolutely right. And we need to think through what more we could do with that. Um, Manisha, sorry, uh, mm -hmm. Adriana's question got me thinking, and sorry, I'm sure you presented results on this and I just forgot. Does mm -hmm. unprotected sex go down for these goals? So I'm going to show you sexual activity in a minute. I haven't shown you any of that. Because I think that actually has a lot of implications for what's happening in your model, right? Because as Adriana is getting at, is it that just that they stop using instrumental violence, but you still have like a similar utility split, but maybe total utility is out because now there's no violence. So it's like we expanded the feasible contracting space. Or is it like actually goals are now getting more of the surplus in the relationship? And so if male, if uh, unprotected sex doesn't go down in your model, that's more consistent with the false case than the second case, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll, well, let, I'm gonna show you sexual activity in, in a second. And then let me think through that as I'm, as I'm thinking through this. Um, Okay, so in terms of the both, you know, both of our like interventions, right? We we think about the soccer arm as the the sort of the soccer intervention can both directly uh, impact this delta u delta v, right? Because the in fact that is one of the things that that grassroots soccer is trying to do, right? It's trying to reshape boys' attitudes towards intimate partner violence and towards sort of gender norms and and so you could see a world in which um, the soccer intervention changes this DU, DV piece of it, right? And just to remind you, that was, you know, this side of it. But I'm also going to 
show you in a minute that the grassroots soccer intervention could also impact a boy's sort of propensity or you know desire to engage in risky unprotected sex precisely because the other thing that this soccer intervention is making very salient to boys is it's teaching them about sexual and reproductive health right and so you could one could argue that like one of the goals of this programming is to kind of increase boys utility from health and through this channel, you could also see a decrease in, in his utility from, you know, from unprotected sex. And, and then what you would actually see is, is basically a reduction, um, you know, a reduction in his indirect utility from violence because he no longer needs to engage in, this, in violence to get risky sex because his, you know, his PM is decreasing, okay? And so for the boy's arm, I guess for the soccer arm, both of these mechanisms, um, you know, I, I should say both of these channels uh, would unambiguously predict decreases in, in, in violent behavior along with a decline in sexual activity, which I think is related to the point, Natalie, you were just talking about. And so what we, you know, what we're going to do now, I guess like what I haven't told you yet, um, and I should have told you is that we also, the, we, you know, at baseline, we asked all of the girls to name, um, you know, their current boyfriends across all arms. And I told you that in arm three, we invited those boys to the soccer intervention. So the other thing that we did was in each of these arms, you know, we, um, so that was in arm three, we invited all the, the boys, but in arms one and two, we randomly selected 300 of these boys. And what we did was we actually ran a baseline and endline survey on all the boys in these communities as well. And so this table that I'm showing you actually now is, bo is the boys data. There's about, you know, 2,500 boys we followed at baseline and endline. And so when I say here, like boys treatment, this is basically, you know, the, this is boys data in, and the boys treatment is, you know, you being a boy in one of these communities um, that was assigned to the soccer boys uh, arm. And when I say goal treatment here, what this means is your girlfriend was assigned to do goal setting. Okay. And so what is, what is this table showing us? One, it's showing us that the boys are actually not, you know, this, this IPV often index and IPV last year index is the exact same index we, we constructed for the girls, but for the boys, we actually ask them if they perpetuate this type of, you know, behavior as opposed to be, do you experience it, which is what we ask the girls. The, like, the rates of any boys admitting to any of this type of behavior was like very, very, very low. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we're not getting anything there. What I do think is really interesting though, is right after we ask them those questions, we also ask them if they ever hurt their girlfriend when they're under the influence of alcohol or drugs. And what's interesting there is like m many more boys like fessed up to that type of behavior. And maybe it's because they were sort of like, oh, I was drunk. And, um, and so anyways, all of this to say is for the boys in these soccer communities, we are seeing, you know, a significant and pretty large because this is actually like a dummy and this is the mean of, you know, boys in the control communities, um, a decrease in boys admitting that they sort of hurt their girlfriends while they're under the influence. I think kind of more interestingly though is, you know, we're thinking about that like Delta U, Delta V term is you would also expect some shift in attitudes around violence, right? And, and I think, more than sort of panel A, which, you know, is hard to interpret because I think when you ask men and boys to self-report violence, you know, we can talk about how much we should believe these results. I almost feel like the attitude stuff is more interesting because we ask them things like, you know, hey, do you think girls have a right to ask their boys to use a condom? And in these boys communities, you see like a significantly higher proportion of boys saying, yeah, girls should be able to ask. Um, we generate this violence attitudes index, which is based on this, like, you know, do you think women should tolerate violence from their partners, husbands, uh, men can beat women in certain circumstances, you know, this violence index is attitudes index is basically showing that our boys now, um, this is a 0.2 standard deviation decrease in our violence attitudes index, right? And so their, their attitudes have definitely changed from this intervention, um, you know, and we could debate about behaviors. So that's sort of evidence on this like delta U, delta V channel, okay? 
And then on the, the kind of instrumental channel now, this is the like, is sexual activity actually changing now? Um, this table, so, you know, apologies, this table now goes back to the girls data where we ask the girls about like sexual activity. Um, and this index is just a kind of index of ever had sex, currently has partner, had partner in the past two years. You know, we have all these different measures. Um, and now I'm thinking, Natalie, we probably should include a like, a, you know, one with, with condom. But all of this to say, it seems fairly consistent in the boy's arm that sexual activity is in fact decreasing. Um, and, um, and so, you know, this speaks much more to that kind of instrumental channel, I think, which is like, hey, it looks like there's less sexual activity going on. And I should mention that this top panel is like all females. And then this bottle pa bottom panel is kind of conditional on you being partnered. Because, you know, you could argue that a lot of this may just be like, um, people leaving partnerships between baseline and end line. And I think some of that is definitely happening, but this is also kind of conditional on being in a relationship. Um, you're spending less time with your boyfriend, you're having less sex with your boyfriend. And so it does seem that there's kind of this like decrease in, in sexual activity happening in, in the boy's arm, okay? So that's, um, that's the sort of soccer piece of it. Now for like the goal setting piece of it, um, there, <laughs> there, there's sort of, the, the idea here is that the goal setting activity was around strengthening girls' commitment to adopting like safer sexual behaviors, okay? And the safer sexual behaviors were basically with the end goal to remain healthy, to remain STI free, to remain HIV free. Um, and whoops, and, and you know, this could increase or decrease violence. And, and the reason we could find that it increases violence is that in some sense now with goal setting, you're kind of, you're, you're sort of empowering these females to make better decisions around their sexual reproductive health. And so maybe previously for both of them, their pie, you know, they were both willing to engage in risky sex, right? Because they both liked it or whatever. Now you do goal setting and now the girlfriend is like, hey, you know, I have this goal of wanting to remain healthy and adopt safer sexual behaviors. And so I can no longer do these things with you. So there's sort of two potential impacts from that. One is your boyfriend could get really like sort of irritated and there could be this backlash where he's like, hey, now there's this disagreement. I still want risky sex. And, you know, and in, in the literature that's often called this backlash effect, right? Where now he's gonna become like even, he's gonna become more violent with you to sort of extract risky sex. So that's channel one here. We actually don't find that because we're, we are finding these decreases in, in violence. And so there's no evidence in our data that this backlash effect is going on. Um, we're like much more on this channel two, which is um, you know, this idea that violence is going to you know, increase her utility from health. Um, it, it, in some sense, in, for us here, um, we also think for the girls in the goal setting, what we're observing in the data is a lot more partner churn. And we actually think engaging in goal setting for the girls is having her hit that participation constraint where now that you bar, you know, she sort of leaving the relationship is looking better for her in fact. And, um, and so let me show you a few things to, to sort of show you that one, the girls in goal setting are much more likely to leave relationships. And two, they're also more likely to partner with kind of higher quality boys at Endline. And so this is, you know, the, these are the impacts for the, the girls who were assigned goal setting. And what you'll see panel A is like, is, um, is ever sexual partner and panel B is current sexual partner. In both cases, you know, you'll see that the quality of the boyfriend currently increases. So if you look at current sexual partner, it's about a 0.17 standard deviation increase in quality. If you're wondering like how we're measuring quality of boys, we're looking at these three um, measures of like his age. So you'll, you'll notice that at end line now, the females in the goal setting arm are partnering with um, younger guys. And so they're around 0.6 years younger. Um, they're also less likely to have like, you know, dropped out of school or never enrolled in school. And I think what's also interesting here is for the current sexual partners, for the girls, 
in the goal setting arm, they're more likely now to be pairing with boys who are now, you know, more likely to be using contraceptives. And so it looks like there's something going on here where, um, you know, I, I should mention that the, the um, you know, there, they're more, the sort of total sexual partner evers is that measure of churn I was telling you about, that the girls in the goal setting arm, there's a lot more churn in that they're sort of having more sexual partners, but, um, but they tend to be sort of higher quality, okay? And, and so the, the decrease in IPV due to goal setting, we think is much more about this idea that like you're pairing with a different kind of boy um, and, you know, and, and it's not that your sort of sexual activity is decreasing. It's just that you have a new, a different type of boyfriend basically. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, I have like five minutes. And, and I guess, let me just say one last thing, which was, you know, we, um, in, in the psychology literature, there's, there's sort of, there's an interesting relationship between kind of goal setting and, and locus of control. And, um, and we are, you know, I, I think what's interesting for us in, in, in that we're finding increases in locus of control. Um, in fact, I mean, honestly, we're finding it for in both the boy's arm as well as the, the goal setting arm, though it's statistically significant in, in the goal setting. And I think one of the things we're, we're also trying to understand is that, um, you know, is it the, <laughs> which way is the, the sort of causality here going, right? Because in the psych literature, there's also the suggestion that when you get out of um, violent relationships, right, that that is sort of an empowering effect and that that can also increase your locus. Um, and so, it, you know, it, it's sort of this, this circular relationship, which it's not clear to me that we're going to have, you know, the identification to, to say anything about that. But, but what I do think ultimately is, is interesting here is that you are seeing, um, you know, girls who were assigned to, to goal setting on the at end line, they are, you know, the, the sort of locus of, of control score is, is increasing for them by 0.1 standard deviation. The other thing I want to mention about the, the, I showed you how the attitudes were really shifting for the, um, for the boys and young men in the grassroots soccer arm. We're not, so the, that DUDV term for the females, we think nothing is going on there. Because if you look at attitudes, um, you know, nothing is shifting for females in terms of their attitudes on violence, um, their gender attitudes. There's just like absolutely nothing going on. And, and so it, it, you know, it doesn't seem like we've, we've really done. And, and in some sense, I think none of the interventions were really meant to do that. But I, you know, it is interesting that none of the attitudes are, are um, shifting for, for our young women. So with that, I guess, let me just say like two more things and then open it up for questions in, in the last five minutes. But it seems kind of, you know, where we're going with this in terms of, of mechanisms, at least for the, like the, for the boys arm, it does seem like the soccer intervention shifted attitudes, um, maybe some decrease in, you know, IPV as reported by the boys, at least while they're under the influence. Um, and we're observing a lot less sexual activity and, and sort of less partnerships. In, in that arm. And in the goal setting arm, you know, the, the decreases in, in IPV seem to be coming from this idea that, you know, these females are setting strategies for, for healthier living. And at end line, they are like sort of pairing with higher quality boys who are more likely to use contraceptives, who look, you know, who are around 0.6 years younger. Um, and it does seem that there's a lot more churn happening there where we haven't seen decreases in sexual activity. In fact, we've seen more, right? They're pairing, you know, more, they're pairing with more boys, but we think it's sort of this, this kind of breaking up and finding new boyfriends things happening. And that, Natalie, is where we're like this general equilibrium question is important that we're not even sure we're going to be able to say much about, right? But if it is the fact that these girls now are like finding higher quality, better boys, you might worry about where these other boys and like who they're pairing with and, and kind of where, where they're going. Um, and so that's one thing we, we want to do a little more on. And 
I think, you know, the, the other thing we've been, you, you might be wondering like, hey, are there any complementarities, right? From doing both of these things together, right? Like, do you see even like bigger decreases in violence um, when you, you know, have both soccer uh, as well as, as goal setting happening? And, and you know, we're, we've started looking at some of these results, but the answer is it looks like no. And um, it looks like no, and it might be because we're underpowered. It might be because there just doesn't seem to be big complementarities. But that's kind of, of another avenue that that we're we're looking at right now. Attrition. Will you ask me about attrition? Let me just say that you know we're we've done a lot of that, and there's just no differential attrition in the girl sample or or the boy sample. And so I think I think we're good on balance and attrition in, in some of these kind of you know empirical issues that, that you might worry about. So let me end with that and kind of open up for questions in the last few minutes. Hi, Manisha, could I ask you a quick question? Please. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, so, so when you said uh, the violence was at least going down under the influence, it was all reported by boys, right? Yes. Were there any data by girls reporting their, you know, experience of being abused? Yeah, so the, the main results, right? When I show you the decreases in IPV, yes. the, those were all reported by the girls. Okay. That, that's all come. So all of those decreases are being reported by the, by the girls. Okay, and mm -hmm. then another question I had was about the supply side having no impact and then yeah. but at the same time your control group was showing some increase in 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 pickup in condom use or something like that yeah so in your specification do you have a year fixed effect or time fixed effect of some sort exactly so we have the post is the kind of end line dummy i see um, but then not somehow capturing it but i mean i wonder if if it is the case that you know somehow that there is condom laying around everywhere and that it, these additional supply in these ELA club doesn't do anything. You know what I think is actually happening is, so remember, these are the same girls we're following over time, right? And they're getting older. And so they're becoming more sexually active in these like two and a half years. And I think what honestly what's happening is, is that the contraceptive of choice in all of these places is condoms. And so that's why you're seeing condom use increasing in all the arms, because that's generally what these girls use. And, and why you're not seeing any movement on like the kind of, you know, all the larks, which is what Marie Stopes was bringing in, because I just don't think they were adopting the larks. They were just doing what they normally do, which is like, hey, I'm starting to have sex now. I'm going to use a condom if I use anything. Sorry to keep asking following questions, but this is live, my last question. So um, are you worried about these, these um, the goal setting uh, intervention being kind of contaminated because girls can talk to each other, right? I mean, you are randomizing within club and then these girls being treated will talk to each other that, oh, I was treated with this goal setting and then why, why not you try to do the same thing? And, and you know, are you worried about that at all in your results? And I saw that you are, you're, when you're showing those results, somehow your observations were pulled or it, looked, it didn't look like you were using the full sample. Yeah, no, so we're using, we're estimating everything jointly and we're using the full sample of the um, of the, you know, the girls from baseline and all of the ones we find at end line. Um, am I worried about contamination? I'm not, so I'm not worried about it in that if there is contamination, it's just biasing my results like low, right? In that the, you would expect the impacts to be even bigger on violence if there was contamination, because it would basically be girls telling their friends like, hey, I did this cool goal setting thing and let me tell you about, right? And so if anything, then like their friends would be adopting these things and, and they're currently in my control group. And so it, it just would bring the impacts it would make the impact smaller. Right. But then it could be the, the other way around though. Maybe they, they would you know, take it in as something good, but then they could deliver to their friends as something bad. That, oh, it's something uncool. I don't know, maybe it's not in Tangenia, but. So I don't think that that's what happened because you know, like part of why I showed you, do they actually do the things they say they're gonna do is like, if you thought it was a stupid, like bad activity, then why would you actually adopt the strategies that you 
commit to like saying you're going to do, right? And I mean, it's not to say that I can rule that out, right? Or that that might not be happening some of the time. I, I just don't think that that's what's driving the, the main results. Thank you. I also wanted to ask one or two quick things. Um, I, I really was struck by the goal setting with the, the grassroots soccer. One, one might argue that by just spending more time doing an activity, it just uh, makes the boys less idle and they're less likely to have sex during that period. I mean, that's just a possible uh, explanation. So it would sort of go away once the grassroots soccer activity stopped. But, but the, the issue that I was, was wondering about also was related to the, the bringing the contraceptives to the girls. Um, and I'm, I totally agree that, uh, you know, it's not enough. I mean, they, there's a lot of fears about contraception and all of the rest and, and, and myths. However, I think there is some pent up demand. And I wonder if the way that you brought it to them where it was not private, you could see exactly who was going to get those contraceptives, that that was what defeated you, that you would have actually had better results if you could have done it in a very discreet manner, because that did not strike me as discreet. And these girls, I mean, you know, they're watching each other and so on, and, and using contraceptives is still not normative. So, so I just, before you completely throw that out, you know, say it was a total failure, I would wonder if you might want to think about trying to do it uh, in a more discreet manner. I really was overwhelmed. Uh, um, someone who's a co-host can actually mute uh, other people if necessary. <laughs> um, so, so a couple comments. I, I think. I mean, I think the you know the privacy issue is is definitely a, a, you know a fair comment. Like we tried to make it as private as possible by you know having this little space and. Um, but you're, you know, you're right. I, I don't know if like, if it had been even more private, you know, would we have seen, would we have seen higher take up? Um, definitely, a, you know, a good question. And then I think for the, I, so I have to tell you, we've debated a lot about this sort of this soccer slash incarceration effect that you, you brought up, right? Which is that, hey, maybe it's just now that like the boys are playing soccer, the girls are busy, and so they're interacting a lot less. But I think like one thing that has motivated us to rule out that is that the soccer intervention ended kind of six to eight months before we came back to do the end line, right? So it's not like when we were doing the end line, like any of this was happening. But what I will tell you that's super interesting is we do do time use for the boys and the girls. And at end line, six to eight months later, the, the one big change in time use that does come up from the boys is that now they're much more likely to be playing soccer or engaging in leisure than they were at baseline. So one thing I do think that happens is that they learn maybe that they enjoy hanging out with their buddies on the soccer pitch playing soccer, maybe for some of them more than hanging out with their girlfriends. <laughs> and that they do continue to kind of keep playing soccer um, and, and spending that time doing that. And maybe now because the utility from that, you know, maybe it's just like more pleasurable to them than like spending time with their girlfriends. I, I don't know. And so it's not really an incarceration effect because there's no programming going on anymore. But I do think maybe there's some change in their preferences about how they want to spend their time. And right. they now want to spend less time with their girlfriends. Yeah. yeah um, and if I, but if I could go back to the, the first part, um, I wasn't so much talking about privacy, but more confidentiality. Mm -hmm. So in other words, just as an example, let us say that instead of the nurses saying they're coming in to give contraception, it was they're giving um, checkups to all girls or HPV vaccines, I mean, or something that all girls would get. But in that going in, you could then do a secondary thing, which is to get contraception. So in other words, it would be very confidential. Nobody would know getting. who is getting contraception. And that was really the point I was trying to raise, that if it's clear you would only go there if you wanted contraceptives, I think that is still not normative. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you know what was really surprising to me? And I guess this is my like gendered slash sexist view. Like I thought all of the nurses were going to be female. All of the nurses are male. And that's actually the norm there, right? That like, so it was all sort of, and at first I was like, is it, you know, it's weird to me that it's going to be all these guys who are doing the injectables. And, but they sort of were like, well, no, this is the norm. It's always men who, you know, do this type of work here. Um, but I was also wondering about that issue, right? Like if you could, if there was a way you could figure out how to have like only female nurses doing it, would you, would that also help increase take up? I, I mean, I don't know. That's interesting. I haven't encountered that. Usually it's sort of a mix, half, half. I've never seen it of all males. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Hi, Manisha, if I uh, could just, uh, you know, have one question, a uh, very interesting presentation. I was wondering, especially on the uh, data on sexual activity under uh, the influence that males report, especially uh, when there was a decrease in that. Do you have any data from the boys on self-reported alcohol or drug consumption that we could I, relate to that? I do. And we looked at that. And I mean, there's no, the, there's no movement on it, but part of it is just the mean rates of self-reported use were so low. I mean, drug use was basically zero. And I want to say alcohol was like maybe two percent of guys actually admitted to you know drinking or so ve just very low rates of self-reported use on either of those things thank you mm -hmm. um so i'm sorry to cut off this incredibly interesting discussion but we're also stealing time for the phd students who are supposed to be meeting with manisha from 1 30 to 2. Uh, so let's close out on the main seminar now and then uh, for those of you who are meeting with Manisha, you can stay online uh, and the rest of us will uh, leave you to it. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Manisha. Okay, perfect. So I know we have a few students that are going to be meeting with uh, Dr. Shaw. So let's go ahead and see. Everyone is here. I'm going to go ahead and make um, Dr. Shaw, I'm going to make you a co host and okay. I'll leave you all. Should to I stop it. sharing too? We don't. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine. Thank okay. you. I can see all of you.